So thank you everybody for attending our working group meeting uh, today, April 25th. It is 11 o'clock. Um, we will be talking about one agenda item today, and that is Article 10, the non-conforming structures, uses, and lots. Um, I believe either Richie or Mitchell will walk us through uh, the edits that you had proposed. So everybody got a three documents. You should have a red line version of Article 10. That is a proposal uh, with new language. You got the existing language that's in the zoning bylaw currently, and then um, the infamous crosswalk table, uh, which is very, very helpful uh, in determining where uh, items were before and where they are currently in the recodified bylaw. Zoning bylaw. <laughs> um, so with that, I am just gonna pass the baton unless there's um, other things that folks wanna cover before we get into the discussion, but I believe we're just gonna walk through um, the proposed edits um, uh, for Article 10. And before we get started, I can share my screen if folks want to do it that way, or if you're more comfortable with just, you know, reviewing the documents with your hands, just let me know. Bob, do you have any comments? I don't. I'll think Bob Ritchie will take it away. <clears throat> well, the backdrop to all of this is chapter 48, section six, which in the most kindest terms possible, the courts have referred to as being impenetrably dense and infelicitous. Uh, th this is the, the kindest thing that could be said about 48.6. It is the most inscrutable section of the general laws has caused more trouble, has been understood by so few people that the whole topic of nonconformities has created a sargasso sea in which to swim. And nobody has successfully done that. I honestly think that if Almuth adopts this bylaw, it will probably be the best example of how to tame the unmanageable elements of 486 because it does what the statute fails to do. And that is to say, be clear in the inferences to be drawn from the statutory language. So 486 is almost impossible to parse, even with the training that I uh, got from the Sisters of Mercy back in the eighth grade. Uh, so what Bob and I tried to do with article 10, and that is basically to implement our mission to come up with something, uh, a new structure, uh, you, you know, redo this to come up with something that is that is new. And to do that, uh, we we came up with a form and structure and layout for a modern, uh, you know, zoning bylaw. And then we sought to keep what we thought we could keep from the old bylaw that in our view did not offend the statute. And then to wrap it up by adding language that made our zoning bylaw treatment of nonconformities a full robust provision of the of, uh, uh, regulation that adequately addressed the topic. The pre-existing bylaw was in inadequate in many ways. Uh, it wasn't necessarily in all particulars uh, inconsistent with state law. There were things that weren't said or not regulated that we thought ought to be in a bylaw. So what we what we did is with the new structure, uh, we created a bylaw that in the first two er, uh, the first two sections, um, uh, which should be um, 241A and 241B, we tried to begin the bylaw by setting the stage for all of the working parts of the bylaw, which begin at 204010C. That's where the bylaw working provisions begin. That's where the bylaw says what you can do and what you can't do. Bob, but before you get to Bob, excuse me. 
Yeah. Uh, apologies for interrupting, but I, I just as a kind of a side introductory comment, just to remind those of you who were around at the beginning and uh, let people who weren't around at the beginning know the non-conforming section was one of the first sections the town asked us to tackle. In fact, it was in our original contract, uh, which was mostly about the RICO, but the original contract said the non-conforming section was universally believed to be among the worst sections in the bylaw and it had all kinds of problems, which was confirmed by all the interviews we did and that we were to tackle that um, as, yeah. a, as a substantive change yeah. to the bylaw. So that's, that's the sort of town background asking us to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so what we tried to do is to create the new stage on which the background, the, the, the bylaw would be written. Uh, the statute uh, sprinkles language which could be construed as the guardrails for any town uh, dealing with the question of nonconformities, but it was not clear. So in the preamble in 1A and the, the preemptive provisions 1B, we try to provide those guidelines so that not only does this does the bylaw implement what the town wishes to do in its regulations of this topic, uh, but we make the, the the bylaw understandable to people that are uh, using it, interpreting it, or applying for things under it. So. The preamble and overview and the preemptive provisions simply lay down those things that the state statute 40A6 either says you must do or you must not do. And with that as the preliminary statement, the point that Bob and I, I think, have made and hammered away at endlessly, the town really can't depend upon the statute. Uh, to 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 govern all of the its treatment of nonconformities in the town, the town planning board really needs to uh, make certain that the bylaw has provisions that do what the town wants to do. With respect to nonconformities, uh, the town is basically free to do anything it damn well wishes, as long as the things that it has do not conflict with the preemptive provisions of 40A6. And in 10.1b, we try to say what they are, A, B, C, D, E, and F. So every time a suggestion is made about amending the zoning bylaw and the bylaw is reduced to writing, you read that bylaw and then you read 1B, 1, A, B, C, D, E, and F, and say, does the bylaw conflict with this? Does some one of those six provisions of the statute declare that you can't do what you're proposing to do? Or if you're proposing to do something that the statute says you must do, does the proposal actually do that? So A through F of 10B, 1B1, is the litmus test that is applied to anything the town may wish to do. Now, if you go to the to the last parts of section uh, provisions in the draft, which is 10.4, dealing with non-conforming lots, you can see in black all of the stuff that Bob and I saw in the original bylaw that we didn't for some reason or other, think offended the six preemptions. And so we simply brought that over as something that the town may wish to keep, delete, or modify to its taste. Uh, we have no investment in keeping any of these things. Uh, I don't pretend to understand whether it's good planning or not. My, my lens is only to see if any of the provisions in 10.4 uh, 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 you know, uh, conflict with the six preemptions that we started off. 
was having. And so that's it. And uh, we've designed the uh, Article 10 to be reasonably short um, after having done the preamble and the preventive and the preemptive provisions in 1B. 1C says what the bylaw is going to do. This is where the applicability comes in. So we lay out uh, provisions dealing with uh, non-conforming structures, non-conforming uses, and uh, then go on to non-conforming laws. One of the things that the statute does not do and is not helpful and you have to depend upon case law is when you get down to those amorphous concepts of the non-conforming nature of the structure or substantially uh, more detrimental or not more detrimental. We have very little to guide us other than the decisions uh, of the courts, but there's nothing to say the town can't declare what it intends to those terms to mean so that when you uh, start to read the bylaw or you try to apply the bylaw to proposals before you, uh, there is a standard to go uh, to so that you, uh, if you are making a finding that, uh, uh, that a, a proposal uh, would increase the non-conforming nature of the structure, instead of just foundering, figuring out what are we gonna think about when we answer that question, we have something in, in the bylaw itself, in which the town uh, asserts its prerogative to make a declaration of what the town means when it uses those terms. And so that's why 101D is so important, I think, to the, uh, to the adequate functioning of the, of the bylaw. Uh, so in the following sections, we try to deal with non-conforming structures uh, and then Non existing non conforming uses and structures, and then try to deal with non conforming lots as something that is conceptually and sufficiently different from uses and structures to warrant its own section. And uh, I guess by way of introduction, I'd, I'd say that's, that's it. If you excuse me for just a minute, I've got to grab something in the other, I'll be right back. Yeah, I, I would just add that one of the other sections um, that took some language from your existing older bylaw now um, was 10.5, which is on restoration. What does it mean to restore? Uh, what abandoned mean? What does non-use mean related to non-conformities? And so all of those topics were combined into 10.5. Uh, again, one paragraph and a little bit of a second paragraph existing language, but um, yeah. uh, additional language to um, clarify those topics within the context of nonconformity. And I think that there has been some confusion about the distinction between abandonment and discontinuation of use, and I think we tried to disambiguate that in 10.5 by explaining that abandonment is something that can happen instantaneously. There's no need to wait for two years to know if something's been abandoned. Once it's been abandoned, um, it, uh, it's over. If, if it merely is uh, non-use, um, or if the equipment and furnishings has been removed, you have to kind of wait two years before you know what the intent of the landowner is. So uh, use abandonment uh, can, can occur either instantaneously or it can be a conclusion reached after two years of run. And I know the town has always been sensitive to uh, the reestablishment of abandoned uses. And I think we attempted to address that uh, including reference to the replacement of unsafe structures in subsection four. Hi, should we, um, if we have questions or comments along the way, do, how do we wanna work on that? 
I mean, I would say for the for the meeting itself, if there's you know things that you want to ask or have issue with, let's chat it up here. Um, and then you know, as as we run out of time, uh, perhaps we can you know just funnel them through us, and we can send them to the to the Bobs for discussion <clears throat> at the next meeting. As okay. I read this, I can see that there are some minor things that I would like to change. In the very first uh, paragraph of the draft, uh, 110.1A1, um, I would suggest that the last sentence, the last clause be written, it shall be understood to be deemed instead of such a nonconforming structure. I would rather say to be deemed a lawful pre-existing non-conforming structure because I don't like the ambiguity of the word such. So as, as a drafting technique, Bob and I have avoided using the word such, and I see it here. So I'd rather actually use the term we're, we're referring to, the phrase we're referring to. So I would suggest that that change be made before we go forward with this. Yeah, that makes um, sense. There were a few other typos that I noticed. If you go to 10.3a, which appears on page 103 of the draft, um, subsection two, dealing with legal legally non-conforming use. In the second line, mm -hmm. there was a there were the letters LPLL in front of the word structure. And I don't know how they got to be in the draft, but that needs to be changed so that the sentence reads, however, a non-conforming use of a structure may be changed. So uh, actually, that's just a type of actually, actually, Pat pointed that out at the last meeting and I did correct it in a draft, but somehow, that draft didn't make it all the way through to family okay. and to the work group. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that correct draft again. Yeah, one other detail in 10.4 non-conforming lots. In section 10.4B, subsection three, uh, we we see reference to uh, sections three a through three g. We don't we don't say through three h, and I'm wondering if that was intentional or not. Otherwise, I would suggest that that might be a typo and. Reference to 3G ought to be replaced by a reference to 3H. Well, looking at 3H, I, off, you know, just quickly reading that, I don't know why that would be excluded. Yeah. So it might be a typo. Yeah. Yeah. So those are three things that I caught when I read it. Can I ask a couple of questions? The difficulty I'm having is having done this like two or three years ago, it's trying to get my brain reactivated to be thinking about these things after the long passage of time. And when you when you get to be 86 years old, that's increasingly a difficult task. So yeah, I would say, you know, if, if folks have questions, you know, let's just take our turn. Yep. Frank, go ahead. Okay. So I'm looking at um uh one B. One B one E. It's or E. It's at the top of page two, uh, where you're asking the board of appeals to make a finding that it is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. But it's not a special permit. Is that? It's just a finding that it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And is 
the application simply made for a finding? Yeah. Which section is it? Subsection E, Frank? Yeah, subsection E. Um, yeah. You, you're simply saying the Board of Appeals uh, finds that it is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Usually that's a component of a special permit. You know, we don't typically make that finding without reference to a special permit, but I just wonder if that's the intent here. This is one of those areas in which the legislature really puts a thumb on the scale of single and two family residential structures and makes it a lot easier for this outcome to, to be achieved. Uh, it, it does not want to make it subject to a special permit, although the special permit process could be used okay. as long as all of the other characteristics of a special permit are not required of the applicant. Okay. So some towns have actually come up with a mechanism for the board to make a finding without it having all of the procedural formalities of a special permit, even if it didn't have substantive special permit features. So. What if we just change the word fines to determines? That's that, 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 I have no trouble with that. Well, I think the problem though, is that the state law specifically directs that the zoning board make findings. So yeah. I think if you start swapping words, you're going to create some confusion. I'd be inclined to do that because what 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 Noreen just said is true. You can use the word determines, but the lawyers here would tell you that that requires findings to be made and not reach that determination. So yeah, I I, I think I I would prefer to leave it as fines. Okay. Yeah, and I think just piggybacking off what Frank was just pointing out, when I was looking through here and, you know, making some editing suggestions, what I thought might be most helpful considering the way the zoning board operates would be to uh, describe that um, a special permit is required for the following items, right? Like the reconstruction or extension, um, if it's, you know, substantially different purpose, blah, 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 right? And that that's based on the board making a finding that it's not more detrimental. Because I think what happens is there's some confusion where if people say, okay, well, the bylaws requiring me to get a finding, well, how do I do that, right? So the process to do that is through the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Board of Appeals only acts on requests based on, um, you know, an application submitted and they have a hearing, blah, 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 right? So that's that's where the finding takes place. So it's my understanding that in order for somebody to get a positive result, the board is required to make a finding that it's not substantially more detrimental. Yeah, I think that um, this is one of those areas where 40A is uh, not 40, yeah, 40A, um, the non-conforming section is lacking language about the process um, that, in fact, you know, it doesn't say anything about holding, you have to hold a public hearing. It doesn't say anything about you have to have a super majority vote. It's up to the town. And my experience, and I think probably Bob in front ranks too, um, is most towns require it to go to the zoning board, although it could go to other other entities, but most all towns take take it to the zoning board and require the finding to be made through a special permit process. It's just kind of a common practice um, with a few exceptions. Um, so well, a special people permit understand that. 
people understand what a special permit is, what the special permit process is. And if you don't do it that way, then you need to actually construct some other written process as to how you're making the finding. Well, that's important because if it's a special permit, we know what notices have to be sent out because the statute specifically specifies what, what notices have to go out. But if you're only making a finding about uh, substantially more detrimental, do you have the same notice requirement? Where is no special permit involved? That would be up to the, the town. town. The town, the town <clears throat> is free to adopt its own procedures as long as they don't conflict with some okay. uh, provision of the statute. There are sections of the draft dealing with special permits. And uh, we all know that special permits are a very useful and effective tool for a town to uh, become somewhat prescriptive and dictatorial about what happens. But when you start to <clears throat> when you start to say, are we conflicting with some provision of the, the one of these six prevent preemptions? Uh, if somebody comes up and wants to uh, um, and, and, and wants to avail herself or himself of a subsection E, uh, that person ought not to have to meet all of the substantive burdens of the bylaw dealing with special permits. All that is all that the applicant really needs to get is this this finding. Now, what we have tried to do, by having the town define for itself what it means by non-conforming nature of structure or substantially more detrimental. Now we have standards and guidelines for interpreting that. But what somebody may wish to do under the benefits accorded by preemption E, uh, we can't add the burdens uh, that would attach if this were a full special permit procedure. Yeah. Uh, so whether the town uses the process for special permits, but limits itself solely to the question of whether it can make the finding required, that's okay. As long as it doesn't uh, smuggle in all of the other latitude given to the town that uh, the town has with special permits. Okay. That's a little windy, but- No, but it makes sense. Yeah. I have more of a general comment. Um, I'm wondering if under 10.1C3, uh, the last sentence in there, I'm wondering, it says, it is the purpose of this bylaw to discourage the perpetuity of non-conforming uses and structures when possible. Shouldn't that yeah. go under preamble and overview because it sets the tone for what we're trying to do? Yeah. Well, um, I can see your point there, Charlotte uh, and Pat. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind moving that. Um, but I think we put it in applicability uh, to sort of set a a beacon for the application of the bylaw, so as to sort of. Uh, give it a philosophical overlay uh, when you're dealing with the applicability of this bylaw. It doesn't really figure into the setting of the stage uh, that we tried to do in 1A and 1B. 1A being the preamble and overview and B being the preventive provisions. If you did move it, I'd bring it into 1A. I wouldn't mind doing that. Uh, but I think that what Bob and I originally uh, thought about when we put it in the applicability section is sort of as a reminder when you apply this, uh, this bylaw provisions dealing with non-conformities, keep this in mind. Um, I, I don't have a strong reason for uh, uh, arguing one or the other of these two views. Pat, you've mentioned this in previous meetings and uh, I think it was also a question that other people mentioned about why do we say this? And whether we say it or not, it doesn't change the, the, the functionality of the bylaw. Um, this okay, could be simply I'd something another, that- we, I'd have another suggestion, Bob, because what yeah. we're 
we're doing, it could come right up at the front here on applicability because that says yeah. oh, it's applicable. This is what we're trying to do by everything. Everything and that might be more effective than what I had originally suggested. I think sorry, I missed. I like that better. Could okay. someone just tell me what section we're talking about? I apologize for missing the first kind of reference. Okay. 10.1c applicability, and we're dealing with uh, subsection three, okay. extension or alteration of pre existing. Oh, okay. Non conforming structures. Sometimes well, it I, doesn't. I, yeah, yeah doesn't I, in the last sentence. I don't want to muddy, muddy the waters, particularly in terms of like creating a public record of how we're going to interpret this, you know, just thinking uh, um, in reverse, i.e. down the line when somebody's trying to understand the adjustments that we wanted to make. But I will say this, that when I do read that sentence in sub subsection three, i.e. 10.1 C3, in my mind, it relates more to the heading of that subsection which is dealing with extension or alteration of the pre-existing non-conforming structure or uses, right? So there's that general legal principle, which we're, you know, all becoming more familiar with through the careful drafting in the beginning um, parts of this that talk about how pre-existing non-conforming structures and uses, the general theme is they can be considered lawful. Um, mm -hmm. So when you have when you have that sentence at the end of that subsection three, to me it signifies that when the zoning board is getting ready to vote on something, particularly if it's an extension or an alteration of a pre-existing non-conforming use for structure, they should consider it more carefully. If you put it at the top in the preamble, it may uh, be interpreted as or have the significance as in general, the zoning board should yeah. just completely look to discourage all pre-existing and all uses and structures. So just, just a thought. Brian, are you suggesting that where it is is the best place? I think if our intention is to limit extensions or alterations of pre-existing non-conforming structures and uses, yes. And I think that uh, more often than not in the zoning world, it is it is commonly accepted obviously you know barring outrageous examples that there are exemptions for pre-existing non-conforming uses and structures you know like if you have a hundred year old farm that's in an area that's now residentially zoned the idea is that they can you know here's a, just you know a more obvious example they can build a new bar you know good well, as one of the two draftsmen here, I I don't have a strong feeling to urge the town to do one or the other of this as far as its placement or even whether it's stated. So um, just chiming in, I, I think part of the purpose or assistance with having that statement in there is you know, there's a particular practice in Falmouth where if somebody's raising and rebuilding, they understand they can put the house back where it was. And so if that's in a non-conforming location, it may be more desirable to have that party consider whether they're able to make something even slightly more non-conforming or maybe entirely conforming, right? Less, I mean, say less, less non-conforming or entirely conforming, right? So, for example, if you demo a house that is two feet from the street, but your bylaw wants homes to be twenty-five feet, I guess you would want the party to look at: Can you move the house back to be twenty-five feet from the street? You may not be able to, right? But to the extent possible, it would be you know, through the planning board's process, you would, you would try to guide people to do that. Yeah. I, I think, I think what you're trying to do, Noreen, is, is what we were trying to do with 1A and 1B. So to, to set the stage for the bylaw. And then section 1C is like, you, you can find a you can find the place where you want to build a house. And then you got to come up with the 
the architectural designs and specifications, which is what the bylaw does. You know, trying to analogize to that. Um, yeah. One thing you might want to consider is just saying it is the purpose of the zoning bylaw to discourage rather than the bylaw, because some people may interpret that to mean just that section. Good thought, Frank. Could you repeat that, Frank? It is the purpose of the zoning or this zoning bylaw to discourage the perpetuity. Uh, Etc. Because otherwise, somebody may interpret it because that oh. sentence is in section subsection three. It applies only to subsection three. Okay. But by saying the word zoning, it, it it says it's more general application. And then th that's I think what we're really trying to do here is make that general principle of zoning uh, not specific to this section, but to apply to the whole zoning bylaw. Well, that would be. Basically, I think Pat was suggesting moving it right up to the beginning. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's the seminal question that the committee needs to answer. Is, is that what we want to do? And, it's and what if the it court is, then sure, exactly. sure, move it up to the beginning and and add in Frank's adjustment. But if it's more, we're more concerned about somebody extending or altering a pre-existing use and structure, then maybe it's best to leave it where it is. We have countless. Uh, countless SJC and appeals court decisions in which the justices have volunteered this thought whenever cases on appeal come to them. Uh, they have often and repeatedly said uh, non-conforming uses ought not to be generously given. They should be sparingly done. And, uh, and, uh, and when possible, they should be discouraged. Uh, so this is sort of a, a philosophical theme that the courts of record have been telling us. And we, by putting it in here, we're sort of echoing uh, uh, the, uh, the, the comments of the justices on appeal. But I'm, I'm, I'm coming round to Pat's thinking that since it isn't an operative part of the Bible. It doesn't do anything. It sort of sets a theme. It probably does belong in section one. Okay. Well, ever since I have been on the board, which has been a considerably long time, as Frank knows, <laughs> it's been whenever we try to work with the bylaws, we try to minimize the nonconformities that the changes might make. Yeah. Or somehow we're just very aware of any non-conformity and conformities that we just don't want to do it. So I think it's important to say it, but as we're finding the question about where to put it. Yeah, I think it's helpful too to direct people that that is your vision, right? As mm -hmm. opposed to we understand that you can raise and rebuild exactly where you are. However, you know, we're, and, you know, obviously that would be in part where the, the um, Zoning Board of Appeals would come in, whereas they're saying, hey, look, if you're raising and rebuilding, what, what improvements can you make, right? Yeah, and I, so I just want to be clear, though, that the, the, the nuance that I'm highlighting is a limitation on extensions or alterations of a pre-existing Nonconformity versus the granting of a pre existing nonconformity or acknowledgement of a pre existing nonconformity to begin with. And, and where it's placed now, I think it limits the former versus the latter. And just to be clear, because I'm not, I'm not 100% clear, that language in that draft is in black. And I take that to mean that it's currently. It was it was existing language in the old bylaw. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So the only thing that changed, me, I have to uh, I have to answer the doorbell. <laughs> the only thing that changed was 
adding the title because that was the format of the whole file along, you know, the, the heading, if you will. And maybe that's that is what needs to change is the heading. I don't know. To to uh, deal with the nuances that are being discussed here. Understood. Although I, I do think that that heading tracks with the language in the first sentence of that sub subsection three, so ten point one c three. You know. Okay. But but maybe maybe it is maybe it is altering general optics. You know. I guess it makes sense to figure out where it currently lives, in, or it used to live in the old bylaw and make sure that it came over unless of course you know the bobs can indicate that this is where they believe it is supposed to go and i'm assuming the, the answer would be yes there uh, it, it it i'm surprised to find it in black I, I i thought this was something that we proposed for addition well but bob and bob one thing that i i did want to point out is that i i i think I'm not 100%, but I think I'm seeing that the red lines in this docket uh, document that we received are red lines to the current new code, and that there were actually some sections in the current new code that have been changed. I could be mistaken, but I think, for example, like regarding the time limitations um, on rebuilding and abandonment, some of those to me look like they're in black, but they're actually in the new code as opposed to the old code. Does that make sense? Am I? I think, I think you're right. And I think it was Bob and I were talking about this. They, the very useful crosswalk table that Bob put together, the references are to what Bob and I first started with, not the new code. So I, I honestly do think that this language about uh, discouraging perpetuity of nonconformities is not something that predated our arrival on the scene. I think this is something that we brought into the text. Right? Well, we'll have to double check, but the crosswalk says that all of the language in 10.1c is from the old bylaw. And it's yeah. from a variety of different places in the old bylaw. Yeah. You might remember like so much of the old bylaw, the language of non-conforming was scattered all over the place. Yeah. But it, uh, the crosswalk says all the language here, which is why it's all yeah. in black, came from the existing old Bible. Yeah, uh, I I just wonder whether it is ac an accurate. It is accurate to say that it was in there. Uh, I don't I don't recall it having been in the original original. I I do recall it sort of coming into existence during the drafting phase, but. It sort of doesn't matter because the town is at a point where it can use it or not as it chooses. Uh, so I have a, a sort of a maybe part two to that line where you say it's the purpose of the bylaw to dis discourage the perpetuity of nonconforming uh, uses and structures, right? And would you follow that up with the, to the extent possible, uh, the intent is to encourage a move toward you know con more conforming circumstances right so be that setbacks or whatever else i like that because that really does go to your earlier point noreen that this is something that you this should be on the table when you're talking with applicants right yeah you know, because obviously there are circumstances where, you know, if you were to move a house back, but there's a wetland there, you can't do it, right? But on the other hand, if you have a house that's existing right up at the street and you have the opportunity to move it back, that would be more in line with what the planning board has listed out in the bylaws, right? So that would yeah. be encouraging people to be more conforming when possible. But so you would take the period, that... you would take the period at the end and turn it into a comma and say where possible and to encourage and using whatever language you want and to encourage uh, alterations 
uh, that are more in keeping with the provision of the bylaw or more consistent with. You could wordsmith that, yeah. but it does, it does sort of add a polarity that is helpful. You right. want to discourage this and you want to encourage that. And I think that supports the board as well, because if, you know, if the board looks at a proposal and they're saying to the person, hey, you know, we want you to become more conforming as is possible. It's it's good to have the bylaw support that. Does that speak even more strongly to bringing it up to uh, point 1A, to the preamble and overview? Yeah. And mm -hmm. elsewhere in the statute and in the by and in the bylaw, we see frequent mention of um, uh, where, where we talk about things being consistent uh, uh, with the purposes of the bylaw. This would be good to have as one of the purposes of the bylaw to encourage uh, the abatement of inconsistencies. Just an FYI, 10.1 C3 is language from the old bylaw. It is. It is. Uh -huh. Every everything in 10.1 C is language from the old different right. sections of the old bylaw. Wow. Is uh, Bob Mitchell? Do you have a citation to that particular sentence? Um, two forty. Well, I when I two forty. Three C. At least that I didn't check the other sections. The, the table, crosswalk table shows all language in ten one C coming from one two, three four three different places. So ten forty three dash three two forty not ten the old bylaw two forty dash three. And I think it's in from C. And then uh, let me just check. No, so it'd be two, under 243C and then one, and then some subsections, multiple subsections. So I'm I'm checking the, the old code. I don't see the word discourage anywhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see the word discourage when I when I pull up the old co code and I pull up 240-3. Uh, I don't see the word discourage anywhere in there, so I, I'm not finding it. It would be nice to see it and place it in context. Um, one one other point that I did want to raise again with with the with the nuance here is um, I 100% agree with uh, Noreen and Pat, particularly when it comes to structures and dimensional requirements. Um, that it's generally a good idea if if a you know, particularly in a rebuild scenario, if a pre-existing, there was a pre-existing non-conforming structure can subsequently be made to become compliant. Boards should look to that uh, um, and, and encourage applicants to pursue that route. Um, the, the nuance distinction or, or an additional nuance distinction, i.e. in addition to the one that I referenced earlier that I wanted to point out is the difference between uh, structures and uses. So again, coming back to the analog or, or the example of a hundred-year-old farm that's now in an area that's residentially zoned, uh, I would I would just uh, caution the committee against creating wording that may be interpreted by a board to try and kill an, uh, a situation like that. So, so that's why I think Bob Ritchie's point about possibly using the wording "encourage" in some way or tweaking the wording of that sentence, if we're gonna take Pat's suggestion and put it up towards the top, tweaking the wording of that sentence in some way, if it is in fact new and was not in the previous code, uh, may, maybe some slight adjustments there could help provide clearer guidance to future zoning boards. I, I think I, I tend to, to side with C, C. Brian's point. You know, I would be afraid if we move it that agree, it's kind of a blanket statement for, for all, everything that's coming under it. This is specific to um, an extension, an alteration, mm -hmm. not and not everything, you know. Um, so, although when you when you think about it, I mean, the zoning board of appeals has the authority, if you will, 
to allow upon a request, a structure, for example, to become more non-conforming. That's not what the bylaw intends, right? So I think it's helpful that people have the general advice that you're telling them, hey, while you're able to ask for something, this is our perception or our desire or our planning, right? That we want people to become more conforming to the extent possible. Uh, just recognizing the fact that, you know, we've only almost been on for an hour. Um, is there, are there any other sections that folks have questions or comments on? And I, I and I think just it, well, we'll look I have one, <laughs> uh, Jed, one other thought. We have, uh, we have frequently referred to the first publication of the notice of the planning boards hearing to that. It's a long expression. We tried to compress all of that language instead of bulking up the bylaw into a definition of what we mean by the first publication of notice of the planning board hearing. Um, and I noticed that um, in subsection 1C applicability, we violate what we attempted to do. We again we 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 use the expression first publication of the of the notice having already um, defined it. So wherever we find, wherever we need to make a comment or comment to refer to, the first publication of the notice of the planning board hearing to amend the bylaw under chapter five, we consistently just use first notice because we've, we've, we've attempted to, uh, you know, reduce the bulk by defining terms and first notice is a defined term. So um, again, we see that we've we we uh, we use the longer expression in places where we don't we we don't need to. So just as we give it a final read, let's make certain that we can use the abbreviated term rather than the extended term. I think we have a couple of instances here. Mitchell, and then I think, uh, Frank, you you had your hand up as well. Um, just quickly going back to the previous discussion about making a finding versus making a special permit finding, or, you know, that, that discussion, two comments. One is, in the existing new bylaw under the Zoning Board of Appeals powers, there's a list of ZBA powers, it does not state that one of the powers of the ZBA is to make a finding. It just has a broader one of its powers is making uh, you know reviewing special permits and deciding special permits as as authorized under the bylaw. Um, so it goes to the question if if you're not going to just go through a special permit process to make a finding, that section would need to be changed. Um, and there's multiple, as I'm looking through this draft now, I'm realizing there's multiple places throughout this draft where it just uses the term, make a finding. And I think it goes back to something Noreen said, it should be clear up front somewhere, how is the board going to make a finding? Are they going to use some different process or are they going to use this experiment process as, you know, with certain guardrails, as Bob likes to say, or yeah. or whatnot. And so that yeah. needs to be clarified for sure. Yeah, that's that's exactly the way it's done. And and of course, part of the purpose there is that if the board issues a finding, how is that information transmitted to the future? Well, of course, we do it through the special permit process because what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're issuing you, issuing, issuing you a special permit um, with the following findings, and here are whatever conditions. So we wrap that all in together so that there's yeah. a proper written record. 
which is filed at the registry. Correct. So I actually have some suggestion, and maybe rather than to bore everybody, I could bore just everybody. board it along, right? That that has maybe some tweaks proposed that would maybe make that a little bit more reader friendly slash accurate to what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I I also, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I also was looking at um, 10.1B3, where you have the word variance. And what I was recommending is that we sort of enhance that a little bit by sort of importing the 40A language for variance so that people understand what's involved there. And we're talking uh, maybe some description about a use variance versus a dimensional variance and that use variances are either discouraged or not allowed unless explicitly stated. And I think our bylaw does not expressly allow use variances. So I think it would be helpful to sort of add a little bit more information there. I think Maureen's got a point because typically a variance requires some planning about soil conditions, shape of yeah. the property or, or topographic features, which may not really be appropriate if you're talking about um, extending or restructuring a, a property. The, the variance, um, well, I, I just don't know, but I, my question really was, is the Board of Appeals in granting this variance supposed to consider soil shape and topography as well as the you know impact on the neighborhood that's not clear from yeah. subsection three yeah so that so we have that's, a whole, there's yeah. a whole section of the bylaw on variance yeah. yeah so that covers all these things that are being discussed so maybe right. just add a reference if you if you think this would work add a reference here to the variance section of the okay. bylaw. Right. yeah so I, I I agree also with Noreen and Frank, and I think perhaps we should uh, put perhaps a, a little more analysis into this, or maybe I could position this as a question, but particularly when dealing with the re reconstruction, I guess I'm just kind of scratching my head on what that looks like if you're doing reconstruction, and then, I mean, does that tie into Noreen's point earlier about, um, you know, if you have wetlands in the in, in the backyard, but what does it look like for reconstruction of structures that are necessary for a pre-existing non-conforming use? Right. Well, so well, here, and, and, and the thing to keep in mind that the committee should be aware of is that variances are typically much, much, much more sparingly granted than special permits. Yeah, keep in, keep in mind too, uh, where you're talking about the non-conforming nature of the structure, that's the town's prerogative to define. So, I mean, the area in which we say what we mean when we use those terms is where you may wish to be clearer. Are we saying that in this instance where we're looking at non-conforming uses that a variance is different from what we consider our normal variance and so we're looking for a, a further definition when we're looking at mm -hmm. that, Frank, you're saying, uh-huh. Yeah, I think that's it. I was thinking the same thing. So then would we add that to variance? Because remember, one of the things we're trying to do is make this whole bylaw easier to use. And so in this instance, if it's applicable only to non-conformities, perhaps that should only fall in here. But then are we also then perhaps looking to add it to our definitions at the front of the whole document? Yeah, I think putting the word variance in terms might be kind of difficult. I, cause it, there, not that you want to overload the section, but I think it needs to be pretty explicit because I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between a special permit and a variance. 
And then they also don't understand what's required for the grant of a variance. Well, I think the statute and the cases are absolutely clear. Variance is a term that the statute has defined and the cases have uh, clarified and used. Yeah, I, I, I certainly I, would think it would be risky if we tried to have a, a couple of different vari variations in how we determine variance. Yeah. Variance here is what I understand a variance to mean in state law, which as Frank indicated, uh, these very, very stringent conditions. And, right. and Brian mentioned this, very stringent conditions. Yep. Uh, however, that being the case, the town can make adjustments in how it defines the non-conforming nature. And if the town comes up with a reason to wish something not to be an increase in the non-conforming nature structure, the town is able to do that in this bylaw. Now, we haven't dickered with the uh, foundational definition of variance, but we have certainly uh, mod moderated the application of it in our area where we define what non-conforming nature means. Um, While we're talking about this, I just happened to notice that variance is listed as 240.10.1b3, but there's no 10.1b2. So that should be two instead of three. Yeah, that's right. How many times? How many times well, do you have right. to, read this to catch things like that? <laughs> yeah, I actually I did catch that, but I did read my own notes, Bob. I'm sorry. Is it? Yeah. So uh, another question just to float out there while we're thinking about this is, was it always, was variance always the, seeking a variance always the procedural mechanism by which, say, somebody could reconstruct a non-conforming structure or use? No. So that's a, that's a big change and something to really, really consider. No. So, the you know, if you have a pre-existing non-conforming structure, you're able to essentially rebuild to the extent that you currently have without requiring a variance. Right, if you go. When I read that subsection three, I don't, you're saying, you're saying now under the current code. Correct. Right. And so, but is it also your opinion that if that subsection three were adopted, that would no longer be the case? All right, which, I'm sorry, which which three are you looking at? I thought we were on 10.1B3. I thought that's what we were talking oh, about. Oh, okay, so the, the variance language. This, this language says if you increase the nonconformity, right. you got to go with variance. If you rebuild and keep it the same, you don't go for a variance. That's the way it's treated right now, right, Noreen? Yes. Well, well, though, here's the other scenario is that if you're pre existing non conforming, so we have a 10 foot side yard setback and say your house is five feet, right? You are currently able to raise and rebuild at that same five foot setback because you're pre existing at that location. So what we're trying to say to people is, hey, to the extent possible, if you're raising and rebuilding, we would like you to consider the 10 foot setback if you can comply with that. But you would not need a variance to raise and rebuild at five feet. But if they went to two feet, they would that would trigger this would trigger a variance requirement. Well, yeah. technically not anymore. So technically now, if you're pre-existing non-conforming meaning too close to the side lot line, you're technically able to go to the board and ask for a special permit to become more non-conforming where you're already existing non-conforming. So now, well, that, would, that would have to include the inference <clears throat> that going from, what did you say, 10 feet to two feet, uh, in the in the bylaw of the town is is not increasing the non-conforming nature of the structure. 
because we, we, we sort of anchor all of this by some reference to the non-conforming nature. Right. So the... so if you're at 10 feet, you're conforming. If you're looking right. to, if you're at 10 and you want to go to two, you need a variance because you're existing as conforming. Unless the town made it, made it part of the bylaw that you could do that uh, because we declared that doing that is not going to be deemed to increase the non-conforming nature of the structure. Except that it that's is, why, right? That's, right. Why it, that's why I think the town has some powerful tools uh, when it comes to putting meaning into uh, what the town wants to understand it to mean, to increase or increase the non-conforming nature of the structure. Uh, that's where the flexibilities of the town are required. Right. But you also, you know, if you have a, a 10 foot setback, side yard setback, and we're next door neighbors and I'm encroaching and I'm nine feet and you're eight feet, if we both figure that we have the right to become no, more non-conforming, our houses could wind up being joined, right? So, you, you know, there is a valid reason to keep an eye on this. One of the reasons why the variance caught my attention is because it's actually in this revised section 10 twice. And it appears again in 24010 2B1, where you say, it's on page uh, four, that no addition, alteration, blah, 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 other than a single or two family house um, that increases the non-conforming nature shall be permitted except by variance. That sentence seems to be to be more accurate than the one we've been talking about in subsection um, 1b2. Uh, well, if you eliminated uh, uh, 1b2 altogether, yeah, it wouldn't change anything. No, and you could rely on two uh, B one. Yeah, and I think the other good thing about two uh, two B one <laughs> is uh, it looks like it's more limited to structures. Than yes, users, which I yes. think is a good distinction. Yeah. And it gets a single and two family house situation covered too. And it uh, addresses a lot of Noreen's concerns right. regarding setback requirements. Right. But it is still a substantial change. Is, am I hearing that correctly? I mean, we've always understood that to be the case. You, for a single two family house, you don't need a variance. You can rely on a special permit. That's right. So uh, I think the 2B1 is a more accurate statement that is reflective of current conditions. Right. Sorry, Frank. I need. I need. A, I'm. I'm 100 on board with what you're saying. I just personally need a little more clarity to understand. At present, it's a special permit or a variance for a non -conforming? Special special permit. Okay. So then, it is a change that would likely lead to greater limitations, but it promotes uh, Noreen's perspective, which uh, helps to push people in the direction of more conforming setback. Right. Now, 90 percent of the special of the of the non-conformity issues come up in the context of single or two family yeah. houses. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and they're really not that very controversial, but occasionally we get somebody who wants to convert like a, you know, a gas station into a restaurant or something. Um, and then we, the issue does come up. Um, so I think if we make it clear that we're not going to burden a single or two family house with a requirement to get a variance, we carried forward the practice uh, of the of the bylaw and the end of and the board. So is the solution here to delete uh 10.1b, which now three should be two, delete that one, but keep 10.2b one. Yeah. And that would clarify the way things are done and should be done. I, I think so. Yeah. I I 100% agree with that. I would even also just recommend at this stage, we now delete the sentence about discouraging rather than moving it, just delete it. Because the fact that it's now a variance instead of a special permit is going to discourage it already, just as a matter, like effectively as a matter of law. Hey, 
hey, can we change if we're going to use that one? Can we change other than to um, accepting so that you're clear you're clear to people that we're making an exception for single and two family stru residential structures? Doesn't change the meaning though. No, it's just, right? it, no. But the, that's also basically comes from the um, general law, chapter 48, too. So I think yeah. it's, it's all right. I had a, a question or suggestion on 240.10.1b where you were listing the preemptive conditions or provisions and where you've got that uh, A through F or whatever it was, what I was thinking might be more helpful instead of um, continuing to use that language about um, before the first notice of the planning board, that that section be sort of brought up so that you're then just listing um, the you know building permits, special permits, uses lawfully begun, et cetera. I think we tried to do our best to track the logic of subsection six. So Noreen, just so I'm clear. Um, because we repeat the before the first notice, before the first notice, before the first, right. Uh, start that at the top by defining that and saying, right. So what I was looking at was like with a, you've got building permits, right? And then if you look at all the language that comes after that, where it says zoning bylaws adopted or amended shall not apply to the following issued before the first notice of the planning board hearing on the bylaw, right? And then you can list, um, you know, building permits, special permits, et cetera, right? Because all of those are within that same clause, right? I, I, I think there's no section of the work I've done in the bylaw that occupied more of my brain cells. Yeah, I was going to say, if you have that, any left that, after working on this, God save you. That that, uh, that this section is my purest interpretation of six. And I tried to stick to what section six said in six discrete preemptive thrusts. Mm -hmm. And... I, I every time I start to think about changing what I wrote, I sort of develop a migraine headache. Um, <laughs> I can I understand a, that. Um, I, I guess what I was thinking was that I, I where, mean, is where, there are six separate things. You got building permits, you got special permits, right. uses lawfully begun, right, lawfully in existence, right, single and two family and other structures, right. So, uh, so what I was proposing is, see, we have a massive problem in town where laypersons trying to use the bylaw are absolutely befuddled. And beyond that, we have staff that look at the bylaw and don't understand it either. So my thought is we need to find a way to navigate the difference between, and may God forgive me, lawyer speak, right? such that we're repeating the language and we're also trying to be quote user friendly so that we're telling people hey if you know if you're in this particular category it doesn't apply to you and if you're in the second category it does apply to you so that people can discreetly see yes it applies to me or no it doesn't I mean, I'd be happy to send you what I'm contemplating and maybe with less than the migraine. All right. Because I'm sure for most people, this is like watching paint dry, so. You know, if, if we think that we could do something that no 
human alive has ever succeeded in doing. That is to say something that is a pure, pure reflection of 48.6 and what it means in all its inferences. And we're not going to succeed. No, no. We're never going to be yeah. the first ones to climb that mountain. Yeah. The legislature has given us an almost insurmountable burden in trying to express clearly what it says and means to do in 48.6. Yeah. Uh, the legislative draftsmen will serve many, many years in purgatory for what they did to us. Um, I so, think that's generous. I think purgatory is generous. And, yeah. So that people are confused, not only applicants, right. but town officials, planning boards, anywhere, and lawyers. Right. I and, confess and, to right. be. That, that's why I'm thinking, you know, where we're going to, we're making this effort to make this change. Yeah. Can we not make sort of best attempts to be as clear as possible so that, you know, yeah. we have people come to the counter and they say, well, what yeah. does this mean? That we're really able to all be on the same page. Yeah. And I have here, we have six litmus uh, slips to stick into the brew. Yeah. And somebody comes and the first thing, you know, is are they looking for a building permit? Are they looking for a special permit? Are you asking for something that you've lawfully begun? Are you dealing with a structure uh, in existence? Is it a single or two family? Is it something else? And when somebody's at the counter with something to do or ask for, we have three litmus tests to stick into the brew to see whether or not one of these preemptions is applicable. And I, I don't think by combining them, we help to understand it. I think to keep them separate let each one stand on its own right. as its own intelligible litmus test. Right. I mean, and, I'm just I'm just thinking that where you're you're listing these out and you're repeating with each that it you know if they're perceived you know if if it was issued before the first notice by the planning board. So in, essentially, yeah. if we put that up at the top. We're telling everybody okay, here's the yeah. rule, and this applies to these following things, right? And then and, they would be listed as they are. Right, next. and Hold it just, permit, special permit. it, it cuts out permit. a little bit of wordiness, perhaps. But I think the wordiness is helpful in this instance because each litmus test has its own full integrity and the provisions. If somebody comes to you and says, I see in subsection, D, there's no mention of first hearing. And then you say, well, if you read the top part, you see first hearing. Uh, my own personal view is this is a repetition that is justified. And I don't think by bifurcating it and separating it out as being something that applies to all of the following lends to a, a clearer interpretation of these as litmus tests. Right. Uh, that's my personal view. Right. But though the other part of the problem is that if you pick out one of these, like, say, um, only special permits applies to the person. So they're going to read it for the wording exactly as it is. Right. And it says issued before, quote, the first notice. And the first thing yeah. people are going to say to me is, what the hell is the first notice? Because they they lay people don't understand what that is and what that means right so that's why i was yeah. thinking if you if you have that line in there where you tell people explicitly what that first notice of the planning board is and then you say to them hey okay so if you got your building permit prior to that you're good if you got your special permit or or actually it's applied right the special permit only has to have been applied for before yeah. the first notice. It doesn't have to be issued. So I would change that language as well. But I would just- I, I, I see your point because yeah. we first defined first notice in subsection A dealing with building permits. So now right. I'm seeing that that would be better right. to have been defined before these six things get detailed. Right, and I think the the- you know, 
the circumstance for lay people is that they can't or don't. I mean, I have kids too, so I get it. They don't want to go look somewhere else. They want the information yeah. sort of pretty discreetly yeah. all together. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So like I said, I, I'm perfectly I, happy I, to send to you what I was mm. sort of sketching out and that might lessen your migraines. I have to leave in five minutes to another meeting. I'm jealous. We all do. It's a hard stop at 90 minutes. And that's seven minutes away. Okay, so are we picking next date? So transitioning to the fourth Wednesday of every month, that would make the next date the 24th of May. Does that work for everybody? Works for me. All right. Okay. Now, provided that everyone is okay with this approach, and it's just a draft approach, perhaps um, what I can do after this meeting is share this video with the with the Bobs so that they remember exactly what we went over. Potentially, if possible, you could make those potential edits that everyone suggested and we can sort of do what we did this time around with just a new version with some of those edits proposed. Would that be something that could be accomplished for the next meeting? Okay. Yes. Cool. So uh, I, I can certainly pass along the notes, maybe in a cleaner version of what I was looking at or proposing. Great. And Bob, do you need anything else from us? Just have people cycle those comments if, if you want through the planning office and we can get them to you. Does that work for you? So I uh, just a question um, before we leave. Do people already have more comments and questions to go over in other parts of this draft? Covered the main ones I was interested in. So I guess the homework for everybody is to read it again and see if there's any Thing else, because it would be nice to come out of the end of May meeting with a almost complete redraft, you know, okay. clean draft, okay. so we can start polishing it for the public hearing and all that. If yeah, you, I'm, if you I'm intend to go, I'm perfectly happy to send along all my notes. And uh, for Bob and Bob, you know, I, not to create too much work for you, but. Uh, you know, so if this is too big of an ask, <laughs> let me know. But I was just thinking it may be nice to have like in black the old code in one red line, the new code, and then, you know, a, a separate color red line for the revisions, all the revisions bundled together. Um, but if that's too much work, no worries. But I was just thinking it would help bring clarity to the discussion, the exact nature of the changes we're making. You know what, though, Brian, where we've moved into the new code? maybe it would be less confusing for everybody to sort of use where we are now as being our base and then bounce, bouncing off that. I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking otherwise we're going to have massive quantities of colors and such. Uh, two comments, just trying to clarify your attempt at clarification. Um, the, so the black right now is from the old Bible. The um, the red is you know the draft that Bob mostly put together, um, and then the next color. Are you saying the next color, which which was what, what my thought was, would be the correction, the edits made today? Uh, no, I was thinking the edits that we have here and the edits made today could be lumped into a color. The black would be the old code, and then. Yeah. Uh, a, a separate middle color for the new code because when I look at the black now, I, I think it is actually the new code, not the old code. Well, I think there it, were, it there were there, and the reason why I mentioned it, I just think that there were some inadvertent changes, and this is just a point that uh, Jed and I wanted to quickly float out, and hopefully, e even though I know we want to focus on this in the next 
meeting, we do want to get on the agenda at some point in time, uh, some slight adjustments to multiple uses on the use table. So, so aside from maybe some inadvertent changes, the language of the old code got moved into the current code and reorganized, okay? As, as I've said, the old code, the language was all over the place. The new code simply took that language and reorganized it as best we could into a rational subsection by subsection. By subsection. All right. So the, uh, that's the only thing that changed from the old to the new, unless there's a couple of inadvertent changes. But the right. old to the new is the same language that just better organized in the new. So I don't know that you know, making that somehow a color to me would just add confusion because it's not like edited language. It's Bob, Bob, it's all right. In the interest of time, I'll just, I'll just withdraw the request in the interest of time. It's okay. Since we want to, we want to hard stop at 1230. I have a, a stupid question because I'm drawing a total blank on it. Got it. Why is there the date in here of May 19th, 1959? It's still in there. Are you asking why? No, why? Why did it come into existence as a cutoff date? Probably the town no. meeting date. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess that's best saved for another day, but we well, have. Well, that's why this, I'm bringing it up because that's a whole big thing in here. Right. Yeah. So that, that has been regularly used by the zoning board. So there's somebody comes in and says, hey, you know, we want to have an acknowledgement. It used to be that there's a second dwelling on the lot or I want to renovate my second dwelling, blah, blah, blah. We do make them prove that um, that's been in place prior to that May 19th, 1959 date. Well, I'm like the only one that questions how that date came about. There are multiple dates throughout the non-conforming section. Yeah. April 82, January 81, January 75, January 94. There's multiple dates going back decades. Yeah. So we just and carried those forward because we, since no other we are to. redoing this bylaw. Perhaps we ought to question those dates, whether they yeah. have any validity going forward. And that's you said, that's for another day, but I'm bringing it up because I'm drawing a total blank. Yeah. So Pat, I will tell share one quick story with you, mm -hmm. which is that we had a homeowner come forward and they had a single family home on their lot. And they had what appeared to have been a large shed that had been converted to like a bunk house or something over the years. And they said, well, so we have this structure that we now want to create a second dwelling unit, right? So there needed to be some specificity as to whether you could take your former chicken coop or shed or whatever and turn it into a dwelling unit, right? And I, I, think, I think that's a good place to stop. Again, we're at mm -hmm. a 90 minute timeline. We're gonna just pick this up at the next meeting. So May 24th, 10 okay. at 11 o'clock, we'll send out the agenda. We may be adding some topics, but primarily the conversation will be on non-conforming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.